wokeness. Woke. Wokery. Woke is the current iteration of social justice advocacy that is focused on identity and power. I don't think there's a single seed that leads to the forest of wokeness. What particularly Derrida said was, he says, if you open the dictionary and you read a word and you want to find out what it means, what's, what do you find? You find more words. Words defined by words, defined by words, defined by words. So how do you know what they mean? Well, it's context and interpretation. The system of words and the way that they compare to each other and the way that they relate to each other is what gives them their meaning. I'm not saying that wokeness caused SVB to collapse. I am saying when you are the risk manager, if you're not focused, on managing the risk to the exclusion of everything else, you're going to have a problem. I think as an LGBTQI leader, I think some of the things that's really helped me on my own journey is, you know, A, being really proud of who I am. For the wrong to rule, the good must just stand idly by. Hello, welcome back. Hope you're having a lovely day. This week... We're asking, what is woke? What does it mean? Where did it come from? Why is our modern society obsessed with it? There is one man who, more than most, has been trying to get to the bottom of these questions. On Twitter, he is known as Wokal Distance, a creative intellectual project to get to the bottom of wokeness in our society. However, in real life, he's known as Michael Young, and he will join me today as we take up arms in the culture war. Michael, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. What is uh, so on social media? They get they when I criticize wokeness or I have a go at it, and um, people go to me, Well, you don't even know what it means. What does woke mean? Define woke. So, can you define woke for me? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a common tactic they use to try and stump people. They play around in sort of the language and like the shifting definitions. So, I think we could define woke a few ways. One is by what it looks like and how it actually behaves, and second, by the underlying ideology behind it. So I would say <clears throat> if we were to try and point at woke, woke is the current iteration of social justice advocacy that is focused on identity and power. That would be um, everything to do with things like critical race theory, radical gender theory. It makes everything about race, sex, gender identity, uh, disability status, and it is very concerned with systemic power and that it caches those things out in terms of racism, sexism, homophobia, et cetera, et cetera. That would be the point at it. I think the underlying ideology is a blend of postmodernism and critical theory that comes out of the neo-Marxist school, particularly the Frankfurt School of neo-Marxism. And I think over time, those ideas uh, mutated, changed, were blended together, and they formed an alloy. Um, a really nice way to think about woke, actually, just as we're sitting here, is you think of it not as, um, it's not like a well-engineered building. It's more like a, an academic stew so you grab a little bit of Marxism from there, and then you grab a little bit of, you know, postmodernism there, and you grab a little bit of Ibram Kendi from here, and some Robin D'Angelo from there, a little bit of psychology here, and then you blend it all together. You know, toss in some critical race theory, toss in some gender theory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ah, delicious wokeness. The activists are not like. The activists are not like scientists or engineers carefully engineering something. They're more like cooks in the kitchen cooking up woke ideology. It's very po it's very poisonous. I mean, the way you describe it is exactly right. It's, it, it deserves the sort of ridicule it has. And there is an accidental, you're sort of implying a sort of accidental a mishmash of the, of the week's philosophical leftovers into some uh, ideology. But it's very, it is very targeted. And yeah. it is quite difficult to define. What What would you say were the, you know, you're talking about Marcuse and, you know, um, the Frankfurt School and all of this sort of stuff. Where would you say the its first and, and most sort of profound iteration came from? What, are its, what where, Where's its origin? I don't think there's a single seed that leads to the forest of wokeness. I think there's a few different developments, but if you want to look at its, its absolute underlying structure, um, its underlying, I guess, premise is that it wants absolute freedom from constraint. 
It sees society as a sort of prison, which is forcing us to believe things and to behave in ways that we don't want to behave. And the idea for them is to fix and rearrange and restructure society so that everyone is absolutely equal. It believes that uh, inequality, particularly of power and particularly of uh, what they would call systemic power is the great evil of our time. So if you want to trace it back, I think that with, with all ideas, you can, you can trace it back forever, right? Like, I mean, if I wanted to trace Western civilization back, I would have to trace all the way back probably to Plato and maybe before then, as it is with wokeness. So I would start, I think the key thinker would be people like Marx, Rousseau, um, some of the romantic writers of that time, you know, late 18th, early 19th century, um, early 20th century writers. And I think that the re that if you, if you take Marx and you distill him down and his attitude and his mood and his approach, um, I think you could, you could think of Marx as the first critical theorist. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier that it comes out of the critical theory of the Marxist school. So, Critical theory um, is one of the methods that the academics who forged wokeness used, and Marx is generally considered to be the first critical theorist. Um, before critical th for critical theory, there was something called critical philosophy, which comes out of Kant, but that's a little bit different. Um, it was really formalized, critical theory was, in an essay in 1937 by Max Horkheimer, who was a member of the Frankfurt School and was a neo-Marxist. And, and he laid out the difference between uh, critical theory and what he called traditional theory. So traditional theories would be like the theory of gravity, the theory of evolution, <clears throat> uh, quantum theories of physics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those are traditional theories. They're, they're purely descriptive um, and cause and effect. Critical theory has a moral valence to it. Critical theory asks, why is our society structured the way it is? Who structured it that way? Whose interests are served in structuring it that way? And who benefits? That's what critical theory is doing. Um, so it's a, it's a narrative theory as opposed to a, a, a what's the word a, epistemological is that the right word no yes yeah. yes yes it is not it's not a theory of truth it's yeah. a theory it's a it's it's much more moral and normative than it is descriptive it's not merely trying to describe facts it's got a moral valence to it yeah which and that moral impulse is broadly speaking, in line with a sort of Marxist idea of what it would mean to be of, of liberation and what Marxism would, or neo-Marxism would have called emancipation, you know, freedom from oppression, from the oppressive society. And so critical theory, th the critical theory of society seeks to understand society in a way that allows them to undo all of the oppression that they see in society or that they believe exists in society. Which was created, so, so their view is that society was deliberately created so that there was an oppressor and an oppressed. They would say, correct? yeah, they would say, well, I don't know if they would say it was deliberately created to be oppressive, but they would say that it is oppressive and it was created and, um, and it was formed and forged and woven together uh, according to the interests of certain people and to the benefit of certain people and to the detriment of others. And they would say, mm -hmm. whether you meant to do it or not doesn't matter, you did it. And so that's the critical theory lens. Um, I think it's a highly cynical. My friend always, my friend James Lindsay on Twitter describes critical theory as uh, nothing more than an excuse to read bad motives into people you don't like. Yeah. Because on the ground, that's functionally what it looks like. And so the critical theory, that's the moral valence. That's the anti-oppression. Everything needs to be liberated. Society is oppressive. People would be fine if not for the oppressive society. We need to be liberated from all of the oppression in society. Um, so that comes from the critical theory. 
And that's also where their cynicism comes in, reading bad motives into people they don't like, seeing ill, uh, bad self-interest and bias in everything, seeing racism and everything. That comes from the critical theory side. And then the theories that they use uh, regarding how society is actually built and function, their theories of language, their theories of how morality is built, their theories of how meaning works, that all comes from postmodernism. And although those two things might seem to be opposed, because postmodernism, at least in the 80s, 70s, I think, yeah, 80s and 70s was uh, denied the existence of meta narratives, and critical theory and neo Marxism is clearly a meta narrative. Uh, those elements from those two things, like I said in the stew, were blended together. They, they mixed them all together and they formed this thing called woke. Eventually, through its various iterations and the way that it was incubated in universities, it, it was cooked up and it became it woke. It feels very unnatural. I was just uh, having a meeting with someone who described society as reliance on surplus. They said, you know, successful societies rely on surplus and therefore, um, you know, we were able to have lunch in a nice restaurant and that was leisure time for us. And and uh, woke people want us not to have that. They don't want us to be able to sit and have a nice lunch together. But um, people that come from very disadvantaged backgrounds and stuff like that, would like to be able to sit and have a nice lunch uh, yeah. together. So it's this place in the middle, you know, this this reorganization and the removal of meritocracy and all of that. Mm -hmm. But it feels very anti-natural as well. It, yeah. And so I'm very curious as to why it has taken hold of so many people's brains when it feels anti-evolutionary and, and anti-human as an idea. So there's an interesting story about, about how... Um, woke ideology and why woke ideology came to prominence. Uh, critical theory shows up in the 60s. Actually shows up in the 30s. Max Horkheimer, 1937. It, it's being incubated mostly in the academic realm. But it gets picked up by, by activists, particularly through Marcuse and Angela Davis. Angela Davis, the, who was a radical American activist in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, was a student of Marcuse which is, I think is just an absolutely incredible tidbit. Um, he actually helped her uh, hold a protest once. That's how close they were. They were really close. Wow. And yeah. And then the new left sort of kicks off in the sixties and you, and, and a lot of people kind of look back on that and they think of the, the, like the free speech movement, Berkeley, and we see the, the protesters and all of that going on. We remember the protest marches and in the 60s, you could see it in France in 1968. Um, There's all kinds of unrest in the Western world. And that created sort of the new left, where the old left had been focused mostly on things like worker rights, the formation of unions. Um, uh, what would you call it? Um, yeah, traditional traditional left-wing values, you know, yeah, about, yeah. about uh, workplace, addressing workplace economic safety. inequality. Yes, yes, yes. Materialist concerns, the affordability of housing, the affordability of transportation, the affordability of education, things like that. The new left shifted into culture. They wanted to change the culture. That's why you see the Beatles writing songs like about how you got to free your mind. We all want a re revolution. We all want to save the world. But the, the goal Beatles is woke? to free your mind. Were the Beatles woke? No, that, well, this is pre-woke. This is yeah. this is that activist. This is sort of that activisty kind of culture that's showing up. You can see it in the beatniks. But out of that, there there was, you know, people like some of those old hippies um, had some kind of wacky ideas, you know, you know, just rolling doobies and <sighs> got to free yourself from society, man. You know, Imagine they, they would no future. Yeah. Yeah. They would say like, you know, society wants to control you. That's why the fuzz sends the, that's why the man sends the fuzz around to bust your stash, man. You got to free your mind. But those people were actually really nice. If you go back to those hippies, they really just wanted a fairer society. And a lot of those hippies look around now. If you look at say how, um, Paul McCartney might view the world today or how members of the Grateful Dead might view the world today, they would say that a lot of their aims were achieved. But 
And so we kind of look back at the at the hippie movement kind of fondly. Ah, it was the summer of love. But there was a second thing that was coming out of that, and there was a radical. There was a radical movement coming out of the new left at that that became the new left at that time, um, and that's like the Weather Underground. That's the um, the Black Liberation Army. That's a lot of these activist groups. Uh, what groups which would eventually become Antifa. Um, the sort of much harder protest movement that that was far more political, politically active, and played hardball politics. Um, this is the so-called new left, if you've ever heard that term tossed around. Mm-hmm. And the new left, according to Isaac Goetzman in his book, um, The Critical Turn in Education, where did all the activists go? They went into the academy. And, and so... They went into education faculties and they went into the arts faculties. When postmodernism came out in America, I mean, Jacques Derrida was a philosopher, but his theories weren't picked up first by philosophers. Most Anglo-American philosophers, most American philosophers, period, kind of rejected his ideas. It was picked up in the literary world, in English departments. So these ideas were circulating in the humanities and in the arts. I mean, you're an artist, you know this. Where do ideas come from? People tend to think that they come from academics teaching. I think a lot more ideas actually make their way into society through the arts. That's a, that's a very interesting point because I've not really, I mean, I know I, 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 I am an artist or I want to be an artist, but it's kind of difficult for me to do so. But I did notice that um, it's it, it, if there is a safe space for this sort of thinking, it is in ironically in the creative sphere when Shakespeare is saying art should hold a mirror up to nature and it sh- should be a sort of countercultural thing. It maybe maybe it did start off as a countercultural thing against a conservative society in America in the in the eighties seventies eighties, and then it became more. Um, it, it hasn't realized art hasn't realized that it's actually running along the same set of tracks as culture is at the moment. It's it's kind of depressing actually in a way. I mean, I I, I don't know whether you were uh, if were watching the Oscars or care about the Oscars, but I I I couldn't name you a single film that was nominated or anything like no. that from no. the last few years. It seems to be just applauding itself in a circle. Art. Can I ask you a question? I know you're supposed yeah. to be interviewing me, but I'd like to ask you a question real no, no, quick. We, that's let's right. talk. It's the whole point. Um. When you were coming up, uh, I don't know. I don't know how how the the uh, British training in the arts works. But when you were coming up and you were going to acting school or art school or painting school or whatever it was, when you were hanging around with artists, um, was I would have thought that it would have been very different. I mean, like the punk era was very very strong. Maybe twenty years ago, maybe even forty years ago, um, and there was a really strong kind of anti-corporate, anti-authoritarian streak. And so did you see seeds of this showing up when, when you were being trained or, or did this kind of come out of left field one day? Well, it, yeah, it's a good question. I think, it, interestingly, it, what happened was when I was training, it was not an issue. And I went to the, the best acting school in England, RADA. The only times I noticed an issue was uh, the middle class people who were at the acting school because my father was an actor and he was a famous actor. The middle class people, the young girls from the affluent suburbs of London would have a major problem with what they would categorize as my nepotism or whatever it was that got me to where they thought that I'd got to. But your working class guy who'd come from a, a building site in Liverpool in the poorest part of the country would always be like, good on you, mate. So the socioeconomic thing, again, was was very flat and bare, which was like, this is an opportunity for someone who's had got no uh, financial security or anything to really succeed, but someone with some financial security and that sort of liberal affluence from a wealthy London suburb would have a massive problem with me. And there was one mixed race guy at drama school, and he would speak about oppression. And that was it. But then I then did 10 years of working on a TV show, which was like being uh, trapped, not trapped, it was a lovely experience, but it was like being within a family. So there was no, um, there was no, um, there was no sort of cross pollinating between other, other acting jobs. And then when I left that job, I went on to the set of a Netflix drama, which was my, turned out to be my final job. And there was a load of people sat there going, uh, I feel very oppressed. 
young people. And I was sort of like, but you're earning £25,000 a week. How are you oppressed in any way whatsoever? Um, and, and then I would point this out to them and they would get very, very offended by the mm -hmm. whole thing. So it, I didn't notice. Maybe it was happening behind my back. But it, we were talking about left and right and, uh, and, you know, new left and old left. The guy I worked with on that TV show was an old left guy. He was always about money, uh, better opportunities, unionization, all of that stuff. We could talk about that till the cows came home. But this new intolerant left, which you have to agree with, I didn't notice until I sort of, yeah, about 2018, 2019, when I sort of opened my eyes. And then you couldn't unsee it. You know, it's really... It's really bad. Did you, um, have you been, I know that it's probably not of any interest to you, but have you been following the, this BBC thing in the UK? I, um, no, do tell. So this, okay, so this guy called Gary Lineker, he used to be a footballer, like well, he's the most loved footballer in the country. He works okay. for the BBC, our state funded broadcaster. You have to pay the bill. I think the CBC is the same. You're in Canada, right? Yes. So, yes. It, so you you have to pay or you go to jail. And um, I mean, I don't pay. But anyway, he started comparing he started comparing government policy on immigration to Nazi Germany. Essentially, he said this is the kind of language and rhetoric that was used in Nazi Germany. And he quite rightly was sort of chastised for this because he works for the state yeah. broadcaster and it's meant to be impartial. Anyway, today they made a huge hoo ha and they and they he was stopped from going on television on Saturday. And, all of the other millionaires that work for that for the state broadcaster decided to strike in solidarity with him. And today, the entire national broadcaster has backed down and said to, they've apologised to him and said that he can say whatever he likes. And I thought, as a wokeness for wokeness, this was a real victory, but it was really bad for society because it's basically saying the state in the UK support the views of this man who doesn't know yep. any history who virtue signals unendingly and, and speaks about things that he has no idea about. Obviously, we defend his right to free speech, but we go at the same time, you go, you know, you have to apply a level of due impartiality. Do you think that we, we're reaching, I suppose, a very long-winded way of getting to my point, which is, uh, have we uh, have we even, are we at the beginning of woke? Are we in the middle of woke? Are we at the end of woke? Where are we in the relationship of woke with culture? Ooh, that's interesting. Um, so I I tend to think... Um, uh, can we say a few things about postmodernism in order to answer that question? Yes, to say whatever you okay. want. It's the whole point. It's okay. just educating me and others. So postmodernism is a movement. I'm going to call it um, a philosophical movement. And uh, there was a theologian in the in the 90s named Stanley Grenz who wrote a book called The Primer on Postmodernism. And what he said is that we have moved past the modern era. It's an epochal shift. And he says that it is a move in the same way that we went from, say, the Stone Ages to the Middle Ages <clears throat> or from the Enlightenment to the Industrial Age. He said this is a movement like that. It's as big a shift from the modern Industrial Age to the postmodern age. And he said uh, he laid out a bunch of, of things about this. And what he, one of the things that he said was that there was an entire new worldview and outlook that you could describe it as. And so the early postmoderns were deconstructing everything. And what they said was, uh, there is no objective viewpoint from which to view the world. There's no way to get an objective grasp on the world. There is no objective point of reference for language. There is no way to guarantee the meaning of terms and words. Language is unstable. So what they would say is <clears throat> words can be, words are defined by other words. Like we might sit here and say, I, I look at a tree. I get the concept of the tree in my head. I say the word tree. You know that the concept of a tree is attached to the word tree. You understand what I mean perfectly well. They're going to attack that. And it might seem like a trivial, silly thing, but there is a, a point to it which actually really matters. And what, what particularly Derrida said was, he says, if you open the, a dictionary and you read a word and you want to find out what it means, what's, what do you find? You find more words. He said, words are defined by other words. And those other words are defined by more words. And those words are defined by more words. And those words are defined by more words. He says, what are you doing? 
It's just words defined by words defined by words defined by words. So how do you know what they mean? Well, it's context and interpretation. The system of words and the way that they compare to each other and the way that they relate to each other is what gives them their meaning. It's not that they have some concept or some idea floating around that's attached to them. No, the words are all defined by other words. He extends that to understanding the world. How do you know something is a tree? Well, because it's not a bush and it's not a flower and it's not grass and it's not a light pole, right? So he says, look, how do you know it's a tree? How do you know that's a bush? Well, what do you do? You observe and then you use context to interpret the situation. That's a tree. Um, if I go inside and I see a thing that looks like a tree standing on the stage, I look at the context of the stage and I interpret that, oh, that's a prop. That's a pretend tree. And so you think, well, that sounds pretty reasonable. But what that does is it turns everything into context and interpretation. All there is is context and interpretation. Uh, Which is power and control, says, right? Well, it, it's going to become that because what Gren says is that they've replaced the idea of truth with the idea of truth and knowledge with the idea of power and interpretation is what he's going to end up saying. It's something like that. That's not a precise quote. I, I'd like to grab the quote if I could, and maybe later yeah, we'll get that. But I want to tell you a theory I had this morning, and you can tell me whether it's a good theory or a bad one. Um, there was an article in the newspaper saying that in Wales, which has been devolved from the United Kingdom, they're going to take down statues of white men and remove white literature and stuff like this. And it got me thinking about this idea of anti-racism that yeah. the, what, one of the constructs, uh, what, one of the things that anti-racism sneaks in without people realizing it particularly uh, is that is, it's, it has to have a linguistic opposite. Whereas, you know, in the past, it was racist and not racist. Now there's racist and anti-racist. So in order for mm -hmm. it to function as a, as a sort of semi-literate philosophy, or, you know, semi-consistent philosophy, the idea of anti-racism has to have a, a an opposite which it can attack, which in the modern world is white dudes who, you know, created, you know, modern culture and slavery and all the good things and the bad things. And it, I was struck by this, that the if any other ethnic group was attacked in the way that white people are attacked in the newspaper by, um, you know, in the name of virtue and anti-racism, it, 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 it would justify we'd be outrage. And I was just, it just really shocked me that one of the things of wokery is that that is, that is coming in as well, this, this new racism. Yeah, so that, they have a, just like everything else, they have a theory behind that. By replacing the modern worldview with a multiplicity of worldviews, the postmodern era has in effect replaced knowledge with interpretation. There's just a variety of different worldviews. Everybody has a different worldview. And so we don't have knowledge. What we have is various different competing interpretations, right? Yeah. And so the idea of objectivity is wiped away. And, and the idea that we can get to objective truth in the way that we do that and the elevation of objective truth to, the, to, the, to a high place in society was really important in getting us all of the wonderful technology and the, the things that we have. So I, I think postmodernism is in some sense undoing that. The point you were making about race is actually a really important point, and I want, to, I want to hit on that a little bit. Since we were talking about woke theory, there's a concept that comes out of critical race theory. So critical race theory was born um, in elite universities in America between 81 and 89. The first event, according to Kimberly Crenshaw, was a an event called New, I believe it was called New Advancements in Critical Race Theory. That was held at the University of Madison, Wisconsin in 87. And uh, I have a video of this on my, uh, somewhere on my Twitter, where she says, um, we were going to fake it until we make it. There was no such thing as critical ra race theory. We just made it up as a name because we were critical theorists uh, st studying race. So we just called it critical race theory. That was, that was the idea. Um, and she wrote a paper about intersectionality, which she called the bridge between, um, uh, how did she put it? Um, the bridge between liberal politics and postmodern theory is, I believe, it's not, that's not an exact quote, but it's something like that. I should actually find that at some point. I hate not having the exact quote. Google it. Oh. But she says, she was bridging 
what she was going to do is 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 use intersectionality to be this this sort of postmodern ethos to uh, an actionable politics. Yeah, and Perhaps so. So just for, just so that people know, intersectionality. Um, it, it, am I explaining intersectionality right? Which is that you take immutability and you create identity from it. So you say, you know, you in you have in you various intersections of your of of you know whether you're able bodied, disabled, white, black, gay, straight. These are all intersections. Is that correct? As as a sort of layman's guide to intersectionality. Yes, that's that's right. Um, so. So she says this, I conceive of intersectionality as a provisional concept that links contemporary politics with postmodern theory. And so what they do is they have a postmodern theory of identity that says that each person, that identity is socially constructed. And so you are socialized on the basis of your race and your class and your gender and your sex to behave in certain ways. Society treats you in a particular way. You're socialized to be a particular way. And so those things occupy your standpoint. So there is a black standpoint and a white standpoint and a Jewish standpoint and a brown standpoint and a Native American standpoint, etc. Because each of those groups has a particular identity, right? What it means to be socialized into those groups. And then Kimberly Crenshaw says, yeah, but you can be black and straight, and a woman, and disabled. So those identities kind of crisscross and weave, like streets. And so wherever those identities cross be, is, an, is an intersection. So I would be at the intersection of straight and white and male. Right? Not a good intersection nowadays. And, and so what they would do is, is they would build a little wheel, and they would say at the Outside of society, if you along the race, it would be power would be in the middle. And they would say the further away from power, so you have white, and then maybe Asian, and then brown, and then black. And then they do the same with, you know, straight, and then bisexual, and then homosexual, and then trans. And they would say that the each of these identities has a certain level of oppression built into them. And so the more of the uh, privileged identities you have, white, straight, male, heterosexual, etc., the more privileged you are, the more oppressed identities you have, um, colored, brown, black, trans, gay, etc., etc., the more uh, oppressed you are. And that forms a hierarchy of privilege and oppression. It's according to identity argument, though, isn't it i mean it is quite a compelling argument because you can yeah. sit there and go you know you uh, you you just have to i was in la a few years ago and i took the wrong turn off off one of the freeways and i ended up in a poor part of la and i was like wow this is a world that i just have no connection to at all so it's quite a compelling argument that there is there are these aspects in culture and and life but i suppose they shouldn't be, perhaps they shouldn't be the things that you start from. They're the things that inform us rather than they are our identity. They're more a, a narrative aspect of our identity. That's, that's correct. It's a difference between identify as and identify with. Yes. That's the first thing. I identify with certain aspects of, say, English culture. I don't identify as English. That's not the core of who I am, right? My, my internal core is... Um, not reducible to my gender, my skin color, my sex, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The reason that they bring those things into the center of identity is so that they can do identity politics. In mapping the margins, that's that's what Crenshaw says very explicitly. They want to do identity politics because what they do is they theorize that society, on their view, was created by and for straight white males for the benefit of straight white males and in the interests of straight white males at the expense of everyone else. Yeah. And so they view everything in society as being corrupted by that. Now, now there's some intuitive force to that. You could say, look, back in the day, yeah, people had prejudices and they did a lot of really nasty things, right? 
But it wasn't just Western European culture that did horrible, nasty things too. Slavery, for example, was a universal. But the second thing is that they, they extend that out to everything. So examples of things that are loaded with the assumptions of sexist, racist, straight white males are mathematics, biology, science, uh, the Western system of music scales, engineering, architecture, right? Things that we w- that we would think engineering, uh, chemistry, physics, competence. the kind of things... Re- competence. Competence. Very self- competence. And, and then this is where it, it sort of... You were talking about art. It's where it sort of intersects, for want of a better word, with art, which is that without words to describe things, the meanings of things, if they become power structures or oppression uh, support systems, you're, we are in real trouble because we have to have some level of objectivity in yes. in society to keep it stable. And mm-hmm. removing the meaning of words and, and you know, demon, you know, all this sort of drive to, to uh, against what are seen as Western white hegemony, like science and all of this stuff. It's kind of, you. It, it's required whether you want to criticize it or not. You can't take it down without without using it. But the, but the white yes. people don't use that. They say none of it makes any sense. No, it's all the system of power and control. And therefore it creates, it, it, almost, it almost inverts language completely to the point mm-hmm. where words mean the opposite of what they, they actually mean which is, I think, where we're, we're heading. We're in real trouble with that. Is, that. is there any truth to what I'm saying? I think, I think you're right. I think, I think it does invert almost entirely um, how language actually functions. Uh, these theories are wrong. Their ideas about language are wrong. Their ideas about cultural construction are wrong. But they do need to be answered because there is some intuitive force to it, right? Like yeah. you could sit here and you could say, it is true that that a lot of European societies, like societies in general, had a hierarchy of race where they liked certain races and didn't like other races, and that was a problem, and that's bad. That's absolutely true. And you could also say, hey, look, if society was designed mostly or most of our institutions were built by straight white males, well, their their interests have to be baked into it, so they you got to have it right. And it's like... And, and so, not you got to have it right. So their interests are baked into it. And because their interests are baked into it, it's warped. And you could sit there and you could say, okay, maybe. Like there's something to that. But when you start saying like, when you follow that to its logical conclusion, what you have to end up concluding is that things like math and physics and chemistry don't actually map the world. And the second point is, That we might, a critical theorist of wokeness might ask the woke people, um, whose interests are served by wokeness and who benefits? What is your goal? What are you after? You have your own particular political ideology and you've created a series of theories to try and defend your political ideology. Why should we accept the validity of your theories? Postmodernism the, at the core of postmodernism is the idea that there's no objectivity, so why should we accept wokeness as being true? Why should we accept wokeness? Is it objectively true? Society is racist. Is that true? Is it an objective fact that society is racist? And if so, how do you know and how do you prove it? And they're going to push back and say, well, they're going to rely on the, the standpoint epistemology, which is that Each person has their own standpoint on the world. And because each person, according to their identity, so there's a black standpoint and a white standpoint, the gay perspective is different from the straight perspective. And so what we're going to do is we're going to ask the different people uh, from their perspective whether they're oppressed. And my question is, okay, so that's standpoint epistemology. Why should I accept standpoint epistemology? On the basis of what? If there's no objectivity, why should we accept it? I love it. You're basically saying that wokedom is going to kill, destroy wokedom. <laughs> Woke, wokeness, at the, at the very core of wokeness, 
Postmodern post theory lies at the very core of wokeness, and because it denies objectivity, it it it's a universal solvent which eventually is going to eat itself. It has to. And the perfect example of this is the is the flag, right? You start with the rainbow flag, then you get the rainbow flag with a couple extra bars on it, then you get the rainbow flag with the black and and the brown bars on it, and then you get the flag with the like the the trans triangle in it, and then you yeah. get the rainbow flag with the trans triangle and the yellow triangle, and then it's the the rainbow flag with the black and brown and the trans triangle and the yellow triangle and the purple circle, yeah. and it just keeps endlessly fragmenting. Because it just endlessly deconstructs according to these various identities. And because it endlessly deconstructs, and because there's no way for wokeness, because it thinks everything is socially constructed, to ask questions of the world. Because when you say, oh, look, we're going to run an experiment, they're going to say all of the assumptions of the experiment come from your white, straight maleness, and your interpretation of the results is just your subjective interpretation, and your communication of those results can be reinterpreted endlessly. You wind up in a problem, in a situation, sorry, where there is no objective truth to be had. Well, if there's no objective truth, what does wokeness sit on? It's, it's got its feet planted firmly in midair. It's got yeah. no foundations. It's rotted away. And so because of that, it has to crumble. It's eventually going to eat itself. Now, I've said that, that wokeness is a bit like water damage in a house. It can rush in in a few minutes, but can take a very long time to clean up. And I think that's kind of the situation that we're in. I think it's a thing like that. But yes, I do think it has to fall apart. How could it keep going? I mean, they're problematizing each other. Like you'll get you'll get various uh, people. Um, you have one uh, indigenous person who will criticize an Asian person on the grounds of not being sufficiently um, uh, sensitive to their their plight, and then the Asian person f- fights back and says, "Well, you're not being uh, sufficiently." Uh, deferent to my standpoint epistemology to my view and then the gay person says well i'm gay and then another person comes and says well i'm gay and black and disabled and then another person says yes but you have internalized whiteness and then another and it's all subjective yeah there's no way to prove any of it it's all just narrative but the problem is it's a deconstructive ideology and any narrative can be deconstructed and so it's constantly tearing apart narratives and showing those narratives just to be subjective expressions of power. Well, then I guess wokeness is also just its own subjective expression of power. And even if they say, well, yes, but we're doing it in the name of the oppressed, I can say, well, why should we care about that? Why yeah. should we believe you, for one? And on, on what grounds do you have the moral authority, one, to decide who's oppressed, and two, how to deal with it? Where did you get that authority? Who gave you that power? Whose interests are served, and who benefits from that when you're selling all of your books, Mr. Theorist? Right? Yeah. Hey, Ibram Kendi, look how many books you sold. I guess we found out why you're actually doing all this. We could be as cynical back to them as they are to us. And so this age of cynicism is actually creating a, a kind of a counter pendulum that's swinging to the right, where certain right wing people have picked up these ideas and are throwing them back at the woke and saying, hey, any way you can deconstruct us, we can deconstruct you right back. We can adopt your own views and move it right back at you. So I think I think what we are is we're in the late decadent stage of wokeness, where it's finally grabbed hegemony, but it's done so in a way that is unstable. It because it deconstructs everything, it, it can't exercise itself in a stable way, and it will eventually give way to something else. But I think we're in in the either in the midst of or at the beginning of a decade of institutional failure as institutions go woke. Um, but I think culturally, um, the turn against wokeness is coming. Wokeness had its day in the sun; it had its moral authority. The Black Lives Matter protests of 2020 really kind of gave wokeness its cultural hegemony and made it the thing in society for a while. But I think 2020 will turn out to likely be a lot more like our generation's 1968. And we're going to move now in another direction as people realize that wokeness really doesn't work. I know that's a long answer to your question, but that's no, no, kind of where I think we are. It's a, it's a, it's a brilliant answer. Uh, also thinking, I, I was the other thing I wonder about is you know whether you believe in God or you, whether you have faith or whatever, it's sort of designed as a as a vaccine 
against wokeness, isn't it? This idea yeah. of the sovereign individual and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, because wokeness manifests itself in a very religious way, doesn't it? You know, it has its doctrines yeah. and it has its it has its worships and it has its rituals and its and its holy books. And I suppose now that what I'm interested in is it, it seems to jump, doesn't it? So it'll go from me too to race, to trans, mm-hmm. to it, it hops onto one marginalized group to another uh, in order mm-hmm. to you know suck that group dry and then move on to the next. And I, I think you're right in the fact that people are waking up to it, but still the level of venom directed at anybody who questions this orthodoxy and this ideology is is really concerning. I mean, I lost an entire career from from stating epistemological fact, which is the United Kingdom is not a racist country by any objective definition <laughs> or survey. Right. And that's literally all I said. So I said uh, United Kingdom's not a racist country and, was com- and my career was over in 24 hours. But this footballer guy can compare... Um, government immigration policy to Nazi Germany and it's a round of applause and I, I find yeah. that that's so inconsistent that it, 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 that's what I mean when I was saying earlier about the sort of anti-natural anti-evolutionary things that as you, when your feet are firmly planted in mid-air you there is no basis you have to constantly as you say deconstruct until that flag gives you the world's biggest headache that you can't even look at it anymore and also <laughs> how ironic that they have a flag because a flag is traditionally a symbol of this is where I'm home. So this is a flag of nowhere as well, isn't it? It's not a, it's not, it's the opposite of nationalism. It's the opposite of anything that sort of keeps life going. But in America, um, you know, we're we're seeing the first kind of pushbacks against it. I watched the FAA guy, the new head of the FAA get interviewed. I think it, it was online. It was hilarious. The guy, they were asking, they asked him some complicated stuff and then some simple stuff to like, what is the safe distance between two incoming arrival, arriving planes into an airport? And he had no idea. And the guy was a diversity hire. So, you know, is it going to take something like a plane crash or something big like that for people to go, look, we've got to stop this anti-meritocratic stuff? We've got to we've got to go back to competence and objectivity. The phrase "you can't be what you can't see" resonates with me as a queer person of color and first generation immigrant from a working class background. I feel privileged to co-author the LGBTQ plus ERG and help spread awareness of lived queer experiences. In 2021, we launched our first six employee resource groups. More than 1,150. Silicon Valley Bank employees in the UK and other international regions participate in a one employee resource group. Our ERGs raise the the visibility of multiple dimensions of diversity in our global workforce. Cheryl Bass, the the chair of the Veteran and Military Community ERG, and Jay Erspa, co-chair of the EMEA LGBTQ plus Pride ERG, share their experiences. That's the risk manager of a major bank that just collapsed. (laughs) Now, I'm not saying... That had anything I'm to do not, with that word salad. <laughs> I'm not saying that wokeness caused SVB to collapse. I am saying when you are the risk manager, if you're not focused on managing the risk to the exclusion of everything else, you're going to have a problem. Yeah. Part of the thing that wokeness does is it diverts resources to itself. And the problem that happens when you do that is that when you have something like risk management, which is literally the managing of the risk of your organization so it can continue to exist, you can't divert resources from that. It's too important. You need to just be single-mindedly focused on that. What is the risk? The more you spread your focus out to other things, the more your attention is divided, the less likely you are to be able to focus on the singular thing that actually matters. Because according to wokeness, there is no objective risk or objective way to risk manage. There's just various ways that one could manage risk according to the way they've been constructed in their culture. There could be different standards. There could be different cultures of risk. There could be different amounts of risk. What really matters is who benefits and whose interests are served, which narratives are being pushed, who is elevated into that position. So to them, the 
key point is to elevate the a person who speaks from the authentic voice of oppression or the authentic voice of color into those risk managing positions so that the management of risk is done with an eye toward making sure that diversity, equity, and inclusion are followed to make. And the problem is when you do that, you're not actually managing the real risks. That's your problem. It's a non-job, you- isn't it? And it, it, yeah. it, it's, it's the creation, as you said, it diverts its resources to itself. So you create an entire uh, market, market sector of non-jobs. Uh, of lack of, um, you know, a, a lack of growth. So, the, but mm-hmm. what it is also doing is it's highlighting the fact this is why it's going to destroy itself. And I think this is what we're, we're working out. It's going to destroy itself because it highlights that everything is a social construct, including itself. Yes. If, if, and if, if actually, yeah. yeah, Rorty talked about that. Richard Rorty, he talked about it as irony. And the idea of irony is the person who's engaging in their politics, knowing that their politics are entirely socially constructed. And what Rory didn't realize is that that's not tenable. Because if everything's a social construct, well, I value this. Well, why? Just because of your culture. Just because you were brainwashed by your culture into believing it. And once you suck the value out of everything and you flatten everything, and there's nothing left. Right? When the only goal is to is diversity, equity, and inclusion, when you get it, what do you do? There are no higher goods. There are no higher truths. There is no higher beauty. Beauty is just a culturally constructed, beauty standards are just culturally constructed expressions of power to the benefit of straight white males who want thin privilege and blonde privilege and clear skin and blah, 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 blah. All of your beauty standards are merely social constructs which are forwarding, advancing or otherwise carrying for the preferred aesthetic of your people. And so when you claim something is beautiful, all you're really doing is privileging your culture standard of beauty, which is to colonize the space and take over at the expense of other cultures. When you do that long enough, all that's left is personal preference. It's utter subjectivity, right? It's pure subjectivity. So here's how, here's the, here's the way that I like to think about it. And this, ironically enough, comes from George Carlin, the comedian. He did a bit on things that make us all the same. And he said, imagine you go to pick up a suitcase and you think it's full, but it's actually empty. And you go, yoing, right? What do you do? You lose your balance, so you got to touch a wall, right? Or he says, um, sometimes you walk down the stair and you think there's an extra step, but then it's not, and you trip. Or he says, sometimes you see two trains moving. Or you see two trains beside each other and one starts moving and for a split second you're not sure which one it is. What's going on in all of those? It's it's you're you 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 become disoriented, right? So let's do something with that. You go to pick up the suitcase, yoing, you think it's heavy, it's actually really light. What do you do? You touch a wall to balance yourself, right? You're coming down the stairs, you think there's an extra stair, there's not, you trip, what do you do? You grab the railing to stable yourself. Let's switch the train example to a car example. Let's say this. Imagine for a second you're at a stoplight. And the car or the bus or the vehicle beside you starts to move. And for a split second, you're not sure whether it's you or or the other guy that's moving. It's not, is it your car that's moving or the car next to you? So what do you do? You tap the brake. Now suppose you're sitting there. And the car starts next to you starts moving and you're not sure if it's you or him that's moving. So you tap the brake and look over and you're still not sure, am I moving or is he moving? So what do you do? You look around and you look for a mountain or a tree or a light post or a building or something with which to orient yourself because you go, I know the building's not moving. If I'm not moving relative to the building, I can orient myself. It's that other guy. He's moving, right? Okay. So this is postmodernism. This is the perfect analogy. You're sitting at a stoplight and the car next to you starts moving. And for a split second, you're not sure whether it's you or the car next to you that's moving. So you push the brake and the car next to you is still moving. So you look around at a building, at a mountain, at a tree and a light post. You look over at the building to see if you're moving. Now imagine the building moves and the tree moves (laughs) and the mountain moves and the road moves and the stop sign moves, and everything is moving, and you become completely disoriented, that's postmodernism because there is no objective. There's no objectivity. 
Everything is subjective. It goes according to people's whims, their fancies, their feelings, their emotions. Everything is moving it's, that, constantly. It's, it's terrifying. Um, but the great, anal- the, 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 the great piece of hope that comes out of the analogy is the catching the wall, is the holding yes. of the railing, is the tapping yes. the brake. And yeah. I think that that's probably what we have to do as a as people with voices. We have to remind other people that they they do have a break. They do have a wall to lean against. It is real and it's not. Yeah. I mean, it's actually terrifying when you describe it in that way because no wonder it creates such animosity in people because they are so confused yeah. by everything. Yeah. Um, so, right, as we draw to a close, what... Um, First of all, t- tell us where people can find you, and also t- tell us what uh, your advice to someone who wants to, you know, help wake people up from being woke. Okay, so I think I, I got a couple of things to say about that. First of all, you can find me on Twitter at vocal underscore distance, which is W O K A L underscore D I S T A N C E. It's a a portmanteau of social distance and woke. I had originally years ago. I had a I had a, a a Twitter account called Vocal Harambe, um, <laughs> and and I I had to delete it for reasons I won't get into. But uh, when I came back onto Twitter, I started explaining postmodernism and wokeness, and it just and I just took off. I have one hundred twenty five thousand followers. I never thought that day would come. It it was ridiculous. Um, fighting wokeness. There's a few things that. What woke is not just um, a set of doctrines; it's a worldview and ideology. Mark Leela in the New York Review of Books talked about. Remember, I said we have that stew of wokeness, and you've got some Derrida, and you've got some Foucault, and some Baudrillard, and some Karl Marx, and some Engels. And you mix in some socialism and some intersectionality, and you pop in some postmodernism, and yummy, you get wokeness. Mm. Mark Leela actually talked about that in the New York Review of Books in 1988. And he said, what are we we to make of this hodgepodge of academic postmodernism with ideas so dissimilar as these? Because all of these theorists had really, really different ideologies, right? They're all completely different. In many ways, some of them would have even been opposed to each other. And yet their ideas... Like, what's the common thread? And the common thread is a sort of social constructionist worldview and what Leela calls um, an ill-conceived, sorry, a vaguely defined, a conveniently a conveniently ill-defined and vague notion of emancipation. They want freedom from oppression, where oppression is defined in the most broad, vague terms. It's not exactly clear what you're being, what's oppressing you, what, what freedom would look like if you could get it. Um, you know, the woke, you'll notice the woke never actually give you a hard blueprint for what their society should look like when it's finished. They don't actually have that. It's a kind of this vague emancipatory impulse, which is why Leela says it's long on attitude and short on, on actionable ideas. It's very difficult to argue somebody out of uh, woke wokeism because it's like it's a set of it's a worldview and everything you say they're just going to cash out in terms of delegitimizing invalidating and undermining your credibility they're going to subvert what you're saying they're going to attack the meaning of your terms they're going to contest the terms every time you pin them down on a point what they're going to do is oh how would you say this move the goalposts yeah they're going to challenge the terms of engagement and the rules of debate they're going yeah. to switch those up to kind of get themselves out because those standards, the rules of debate in terms of engagement are all socially constructed. Anyway, we can construct new ones They're They're going to, because they view everything through the lens of power. Your standards are really just a power movement to benefit you at the expense of me because your ideology does well, according to those standards and mine doesn't. So you picked your standards in order to make me look bad, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's very, it can be very difficult to, to, to get somebody out of out of a, a woke ideology and worldview, I think the correct thing to do is you can't argue with them on their own terms. 
A lot of times people try to curry favor with them by saying, I also am against racism. The thing that you have to go after is the underlying ideology. And you just have to simply say, no, that's not true. That's not correct. You're wrong. And say it forcefully enough. And when they say it's all socially constructed, say, look, is your standard, is that true? Is what you're saying true? When they yeah. challenge coherence, really? You're challenging the idea of coherence? Okay. Do you want me to give a coherent response to the challenge of coherence? Oh, you're saying my views aren't true. You're saying that wokeness is correct. Is that true? Is that objectively correct? When they say, um, uh, we don't really need merit. Okay, well, if we don't really need merit, why should we hire you and not some bum off the street? <laughs> At every point, all of their their um, their views need to be challenged vigorously, rigorously, thoughtfully. People need to know it, need to understand it, and and they need to understand that the moral shaming that's employed, that the moral gamesmanship that's played, that the their attempt. I said earlier today that part of the, the postmodern condition is that every conversation devolves and rev into and revolves around um, sort of jockeying for credibility and validity and whose ideas get to be powerful within the conversation. When woke people seek to take power within the conversation, you got to call them on it and say, look, you're trying to grab a position. You're trying to make yourself the up here and you're trying to move me down to here i'll have a conversation with you on even terms i am not for a second going to grant you um the position of teacher or the arbiter of truth in the conversation i do not accept your subjective standards and when they play their games as soon as they challenge truth you got to hit them back on it why should i accept that when they challenge logic all right if there's no such thing as logic why should i accept what you said why can't yeah. i say something completely illogical when they attack truth what why shan't I say something completely false? If you, if, why don't I get to determine what's truth? Well, yeah. you're a white male and you have power. Is that true? Is it objectively true? And if so, how do you know? You have to push on it. Yeah. No quarter. And you've got to go after the underlying ideas relentlessly. The second yeah. thing is um, that a lot of it proceeds by emotional manipulation. And you need to call out the emotional manipulation instantly. The language of trauma, the language of harm, the language of, you know, uh, it's the whole, would you rather have a trans kid or a dead kid thing, right? Yeah. Plays that are meant to subvert your moral authority and put you on the back foot to make you look like the bad guy, to weaponize empathy. You have to recognize that, diffuse it, and name the dynamic. Look, what you're doing is weaponizing empathy in the name of trying to advance your worldview, and I don't have to accept that, and I don't have to play by those rules. That's what you're doing, and you have to call it out and say, um, yeah, and, and reject their terms. Do not let them set the standards because their standards will be ever-shifting. Every time they shift the goalposts, you have to call it out, and if you can do that successfully, um, you might not get the diehard woke people, but you will strengthen the spines of the majority of people, I think, who think this stuff is nonsense. Wokeness has took over our institutions. It's laundered our, itself into all of our institutions of culture, prestige, sense-making, all of the so-called cultural megaphones of the various of, uh, of artistic institutions, governmental institutions, academic institutions have been colonized and taken over by wokeness. But I think that the average person rejects it. And so when people like you stand up, it stiffens the spines of many. Wow, uh, that, is a, that is absolutely amen to that. It is literally speaking truth to power. Um, yep. Now, Michael, I can see behind you, you've got some guitars. I do. So um, can, you, can you play me an ode to Woke to, uh, <laughs> to leave us out, to, to, to play us out? Oh, yes. An ode to Wokeness? I don't know if I know an ode or, to or, Wokeness. Or a rallying cry, or just your favourite riff. <laughs> Thank you.
You see, that object <laughs> that objectively is beautiful. Michael Young, you. also it. known as Vocal Distance, thank you for explaining something very, very complicated in a way which everyone can understand. It's been a real pleasure speaking to you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.